All right, good morning, everyone. I'm Anson Stewart, and I appreciate the opportunity to update you on some of the work I've done since uh, presenting here last year. So I'm talking about incremental BRT in car-centric cities. So basically looking at cities in Northern America, Europe, where the political constraints make it hard to implement the full-fledged BRT that we've seen in some of the typical South American cases. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that in my, my research objective, and then I'm going to talk about um, one kind of track towards modeling that I've taken, which is looking at pre-post BRT implementations or incremental BRT implementations in cities, um, and then move into a second kind of track of analysis I'm looking at doing a cross-sectional comparison, um, and that's based on some direct ridership modeling. So the big question here, um, many of you I think were at the workshop on Sunday afternoon where it's, you know, are we talking about defining BRT as something that's an integrated package that all of the things have to be there? Or is it something where development can be incremental, where we can leave room for possible upgrading? It's not really a question that there's been a clear answer to, but I think a lot of people are in this second camp, that we can make small changes along the way. So the question then becomes, what are the most effective small changes to make? What are the most effective um, incremental changes in terms of, of building ridership. Um, briefly, I know many of you have seen or written some of the, um, <laughs> the, the GCRP reports on what the, what the different elements are and how these elements can contribute um, to BRT service and improving service. Basically, I think a lot of the work so far has gone looking at these service characteristics to performance indicators. So saying, OK, if we put in a certain percentage of dedicated lanes or priority lanes, of signal priority, what does that get us in terms of speed, in terms of reliability, in terms of loading? Those are important questions, but ultimately what, what agencies and what the public cares about um, is, is the ridership and is the productivity. So what are, what are the effects of, of these BRT features on ridership? And part of that is mediated by the performance indicators. But a lot of what is being said about BRT is that there's actually kind of a direct link here between um, this kind of idea of BRT, a nice branded system that, you know, even if, even if you control for commercial speed, even if, if reliability, um, even if people don't perceive a big reliability change, they're looking at all of these features and, and ridership is growing. That, of course, um, brings in some external factors. If you're talking about um, comparing different cities, you need to look at the land use, the demographics, all of these different features in making that jump from the service characteristics to the ridership. So that, that's where my research objective comes in. I'm looking to determine which incremental upgrades to conventional bus service most effectively improve productivity and quality in the context, like I said, of larger, more developed cities. So moving now into kind of the first type of analysis I've done. Um, I'm looking at comparing longitudinal changes within cities. This is obviously kind of the most straightforward thing to do when cities have very different land use socioeconomic con contexts. So I'm making the dependent variable of this analysis kind of the percent increase in ridership for a given corridor, moving from a conventional bus service uh, to more of a, an incremental BRT. The independent variables um, also need to be kind of that, that change within the same corridor. So these three independent variables, um, they all start with presumably a baseline of zero. Um, if you have a conventional bus service, Presumably, none of the corridor has dedicated lanes. There's no priority uh, at, the, at the traffic lights. And there's no auto reporting. Um, and then these last two are going to be percentage changes, the deltas. So a lot of this comes from um, the characteristics of bus rapid transit for decision makers um, with some additional, uh, additional stats put in. Um, you can see here. Those are the indicators I talked about, and then the, the percent ridership increase at the very end. This table is sorted by the percentage of um, the corridor that has dedicated lanes. The definition of that is fairly loose. Um, a lot would qualify as a dedicated lane. And there is a lot um, that kind of would, would suggest caution about this kind of analysis. Um, the definitions are not all that clear, like I said. And um, in looking at the percentage ridership increase, um, you may not be capturing full ramp-up effects, and there's not really a consistent um, 
it, because these are different cities, it hasn't been measured consistently. Is this one year after implementation, five years in, after implementation? So this, this gives a very rough picture, but I think it's still a helpful picture. Um, you can also see here that this table is broken down by um, what I kind of clustered as three different types based on the percentage of dedication. So you have, um, this one should actually be one lower, but you have upwards of 90% and then kind of the middle, um, the middle percents of the corridor being dedicated and then very little or no lane dedication. So moving forward with kind of a regression of this, just looking first of all, um, kind of one-on-one -on -one comparisons. The clearest relationship in, in the preceding uh, statistics are with ridership increase and the percentage of dedicated lanes. We have a pretty strong correlation there. Um, and that's something that makes a lot of sense. People are drawn to the red paint on, on the pavement. People are drawn to that, that kind of strong branded BRT service. So you can see here, oops, um, you can see here, again, this is the same clustering where you have pretty much no lane dedication, very little lane dedication. You still have an average of a 31% increase um, in ridership. Moving forward with some of the more BRT light, like the select bus service in New York, the MAX in Las Vegas and Kansas City, um, the health line in Cleveland, getting upwards of a 50% increase in ridership on average. And then moving to the full, more full-fledged BRT, um, like the orange line in Los Angeles, getting upwards of, of 75 or 80% increase in ridership. So I think this is a pretty convincing, a pretty convincing case about the importance of right-of-way dedication. It becomes even more convincing when you look at the relationship between the percentage speed increase and the percentage of dedicated lanes. There's basically no correlation here. So that's, that's saying it's all about perceptions, right? If the, the dedicated lanes aren't giving people a, a meaningful speed increase, but they're still responding in terms of ridership, there must be something really strong in the perceptions about, about those dedicated lanes. Um, this is looking again at the percentage in speed increase versus uh, another, one of the, another one of the independent variables, um, the, stops, the percentage change in stop spacing. Again, very little correlation. So, uh, and sorry, this is the last one. This one, I, I, I would actually like some help in trying to figure out. This is looking at um, the percentage ridership increase versus the percentage speed increase. And I think some of what's going on here is just an artifact of how I'm, how I'm presenting the data. Because these two systems kind of had low baseline ridership in terms of what they could be, Eugene, because it was a very low ridership system, and Boston, because um, you had a lot of, of demand that was on the orange line. And then there were some artificial things about changes in, in fare policy, et cetera, that made the percentage ridership increase kind of greater than what would be expected. So I think these two can kind of be explained by, by different outside factors. Um, do, do, do you have the same <laughs> phenomenon of a very slow basis on those points over there, too? A very low, low base. a low baseline in terms of speed? Yes. Or in terms of ridership? You said Eugene and Boston were, were different. Right. Does, does those, so those factors appear over there too? I think less so. So I think, I think they may be outliers, yeah. Okay. Um, but I, I want to look a little bit more into, into these two. Um, so, so just coming up with a model based on this, the best one I could estimate um, didn't did not include the signal priority um, or the or the or one of the other ones. Um, but the the best model in terms of fit that I could see again saw that counterintuitive relationship in terms of the sign of the speed increase. But this this pretty straightforward simple model actually captured over sixty percent of it, it explained over over sixty percent of the variation. So saying again the strong impact of the percentage of dedicated lanes and the, the impact, again, in terms of perception of, of the stop spacing. Now, ridership is only one part of the picture. A lot of the ridership gains that happened in the corridors that I talked about were also um, because of increased service offerings. So I think it's important in kind of the next part of my analysis to look at productivity. You can see here that you know, what may have been a successful case, if you just look at the ridership, the, 
the first in St. <coughs> select bus service in New York, um, there was actually a drop in productivity. Same thing here in, in Los Angeles. You have two of the Metro Rapid corridors, both of which saw increases in ridership, um, but only one of which saw a gain in productivity. So that's kind of the focus on my um, on the next part of my analysis, um, which really relies on kind of sketch planning tools, direct ridership modeling. A lot of this has been used in the past to compare different cities, different regions, different systems in the US, so I think it would be a useful tool here. Um, in particular, a recent paper um, applied it directly to bus rapid transit or BRT light, incremental BRT in Los Angeles, so I think it's it's a pretty useful application um, here. That, that, that paper um, by Cervero focused on stock level ridership, which most of the direct ridership modeling papers do focus on. I'm looking to extend that a little bit to do more of a corridor level analysis. Um, and there will be kind of a, a few ways um, that I hope to extend that, and I will put it into them now. Um, in terms of this analysis, the cross-sectional one, I'm looking at making, like I said, I'm looking at making the dependent variable more productivity, like I said, not just the boardings, but the boardings per service hour. Um, and then looking at independent variables that include corridor, kind of attributes of the corridor and performance there, also land use and demographic attributes, and network attributes, um, which is, and, and I'd like to focus on these two. I've, I've shown this table before I showed it last year, so I won't get too much into the land use now. Um, one of the things I'm really interested in in terms of extending the work that's been done in the past and kind of moving forward with my own work is, is the network effect. So this is the orange line in Los Angeles. You wouldn't have nearly the ridership you have if it didn't feed directly into the red line at the end of its route. Similarly, with the select bus service in New York, you, you can't really look at ridership without looking at all of the different transfers to subways that are there. So bringing in these network effects to the equation is an important step, I think. And I'm hoping to do that um, kind of taking a middle ground to, to two things that have been done. Cervera and his direct ridership model used only the number of lines or the number of um, trips that pass the, pass the stop at a given point. Like I said, I'm trying to extend that to a corridor analysis. Um, so I want to do something a little bit broader. Um, something a little too broad was kind of a network level uh, stop transfer potential that was presented earlier this year. That's a little too broad for me, so I'm hoping to use kind of a middle ground um, based on based on the service or, sorry, based on the frequency share of different branches. So basically, it's easy to look at uh, feed or potential if you're only going stop by stop and just say how many buses need that stop. But if you're looking at different branches and trying to aggregate up the corridor, if this branch has a different frequency than this branch and they're both less than the, the frequency um, of the trunk, the trunk should be weighted more heavily. So I've developed um, kind of a stop transfer potential metric that takes into account uh, the service along the corridor. So this is an example of Boston, of the two silver line corridors. The red, the, the red circles represent rail transfer potential, and the green ones represent uh, bus transfer potential. So you can see here along the trunk, you have much stronger transfer potential because of the interaction between the high service along the corridor, which then decreases as you get out onto the branches. Similarly, this is um, the analysis for Los Angeles where you can see um, kind of the, the strong rail transfer potential and then the bus transfer potential as well. Um, one other extension I'm looking at considering is um, whether to use circular buffers or network buffers. I've heard varying thoughts on that and would appreciate any other thoughts you could give me on, on which of those would be appropriate, which might bring in yeah. um, certain built environment characteristics, etc. With that, we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you, Alison. Uh, comments on that? Questions? Yes? Just a small observation. So you said it's dependent on the cars in brick. So I was just trying to understand how would it be relevant in some of the other developing countries where cars are not there, but they are two wheelers in that. Just how relevant would this be to your two wheelers? So I, I think about it not necessarily in terms of the vehicles, but just kind of what, what political capital is available, right? I think in in many cases, I've, I've, it's a good point because I, I guess 
you can say in, in some cases in the developing world there hasn't been the political capital to, to fully implement a full-fledged BRT. There's been kind of the rich automobile drivers saying. Um, so I guess the distinction might be a little bit artificial. Um, but in, in terms of two-wheelers, <coughs> like in, in terms of interference with the corridor, is that, is that what you were asking? So you said if you're looking at the, the, the impact on the car-centric corridors, what I'm asking is that instead of cars, you have two wheelers, a two wheeler centric mm -hmm. corridor. So what would be the relevance of this study in that context? So yeah, so I guess to answer that question, it, it depends on whether or not you think the, the, the private road users have the political capital to back kind of a full-fledged one-off BRT implementation. Kind of the, the premise of my project is that you're making these small changes. Um, and if you can make all the big changes at once, I don't think a lot of these these um, considerations would apply. I see lots of understanding. Please be brief. I have Lucho, I have Dio, I have Tesoswami, I have Laurel, I have Sam. So be brief. Uh, I would like to note a little bit more about the network effect. Because this is a very important issue in Latin America. It was trying to capture how to measure the effect of integration on the corridor and vice versa. Yeah. The corridor on the integration. So, what would be the indicators to capture this kind of effect of the scope of integration in the, in the, in the, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. This is something I was actually looking at um, really closely when I was working with Count Santiago over last summer. Um, I think it would be really cool to calibrate a model just looking at the potential for transfers with actual AFC data. So, in Trump, with, with Count Santiago, you can actually see how many people make the transfers from any of the routes feeding into this stop to the corridor? To be, to be honest, I would, and I'm going to run into the middle, uh, uh, I would take that question out of the scope of the, the, of, the, of the thesis because when you put integration, all of a sudden, the trip pattern changes so much yeah, that it's impossible, it's impossible to predict. Yeah, yeah. So without looking at the whole network. So, yeah. so if you're looking at a single corridor, which I think is very interesting, what, what, what can we achieve by improving the level of service of a corridor? I would let take the, the issue about uh, integration of services out. However, you may, you may, what you may do is incremental approach in terms of improving eventually some transferring experiences, but not really incorporating effects that are, are observed beyond the corridor. But in any, in any case, this is a point that we it is a need for the research. Because it's very important to know what is happening you know, when a, you design a BRT without a vision of the system. And go increasing the BRT step by step as a network. And if you go from the uh, integrated system to incorporate the BRT, how to measure this and how to, that is a point that we should open a window for the series. I would make one quick point on that. Um, the, the potential for GTFS here is huge. Um, all of this can be done almost trivially with a standard GTFS, and then it can be done for any city that has GTFS. So Trans Santiago just released their feed. The more agencies that release kind of open GTFS feeds, the easier this becomes. Yeah. David Hensher did a research that showed that waiting time was the, 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 the key element. So frequency was the key element. Uh, are you looking into that uh, or comparing to the results of this 80 city comparison? Um, I, I'm hoping to bring that in in kind of looking at the productivity as, as the dependent variable. But if you think it might be better to include it. it uh, he just, found that frequency was the best predictor. That's all I wanted to. Okay. Uh, for the Swami, the yeah. then Sam. Uh, this is about the speed. Uh, probably, uh, what about the relative speed in terms of the bus versus other traffic? Maybe that would give more clue rather than just looking at the speed. Yeah, that, that, would, that would be a, a good extension. As with looking at kind of, instead of looking, for example, just at income, looking at kind of more specifically at vehicle ownership costs, there, there are a lot kind of there are a lot of ways I could kind of narrow the analysis like that. Yeah. So do you have any idea of where the increased ridership is coming from? Is it transfers from trips not being made, transfers from cars, transfers from other transit service? 
Um, some of the agencies have reported, again, the challenge with this is that I'm pulling from lots of different agencies. Um, in the case of Los Angeles, that's the one that sticks out most clearly in my mind. It was actually, I think, 20 to 25% of the riders had previously driven to take the trip. So I, I wouldn't imagine all of the cases would be that high, um, especially in the case of Boston. A lot of this was riders <coughs> coming off of um, the orange line, which kind of parallels. Um, so I, I think it varies, but it would be good to look into that. Sam? Yeah, two points. Number one, I think the reason that the uh, silver line may be an outlier, outlier with respect to the, to the uh, contribution to ridership gains of travel time is it's a very short car journey. And even if you double the speeds from what was there before, which you didn't, you would still not be saving a whole lot of time. So there's something else that's explaining. As Dario points out, perhaps it's frequency, perhaps it's branding uh, that explains the ridership gain. The other question and the other comment may be more appropriate for Professor Macario, and that deals with this notion of incremental development. Uh, some of us, maybe a little violently perhaps, or too violently, have had a discussion on the notion of the value of setting a gold standard for BRT when saying that if you're not the gold standard, you're not so good. Some of us think that's not such a good idea, but that quote that you put up, from uh, TCRP 90, dealing with incremental development, says something in that regard. And that's why I asked Professor Macario, does it make it easier to overcome political societal issues that you mentioned when you're starting with a very, very well-functioning BRT light that has meaningful components and is judged to be quite successful? Is it easier to get more dedicated right-of-way, for example? seems to be the most difficult thing to achieve when you have a higher starting point and you can build on success. And I, this doesn't have anything to do with ridership, but it really very, very much has to do with this notion of, of whether it, that nothing is better than, than, the gold, than anything but the gold standard. Uh, I can, can I, uh, well, I think we have to distinguish two things that we are dealing here at, uh, with the BRT uh, system at different scales. Okay. And uh, they are equally important, but to answer your question, we have to position ourselves with the highs of the citizen or the highs of the user. And so and for the citizen or for the user, it's not the corridor that is important. It is the system that is going to use and that is going to use to move from its origin to its destination. So it is the so the network as a whole that provides the service to the citizen, and uh, for this all the elements are important. So if you tell me what is easier to achieve, a good performance network if we have good performance elements, yes, of course, yes. Well, that wasn't the question. It's a, it's the question is, is it's very politically difficult in many places, particularly in North America, to get everything you want that would be desirable and um, I think universal experience judged to be productive as part of the BRT system, most notably dedicated right of way, for example. Is it easier to get that from a political and policy making perspective when your starting point is 70% of the right of way is dedicated, not 100%, but you need a lot of political will to get the 30%? Yeah, it is. It is easier to, uh, and it is easier to get political acceptability and political support for that priority. You would agree with that? Yes. Okay.